<laughs> so, it's another Tuesday night. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another evening with Scuba and the Rye. Rye guy. Yep, Rye guy. So, how you been, Rye? I've been good. Good and fresh. Good and fresh? Well, you know, you, you were talking about, what, taking a couple days off from work? Yes, that kind of freshness. Get to relax a little bit. Oh. Well, it took off because it was ODU's fall break. So uh, I was like, since I don't have no school work, yeah, I'll take some days off so I don't have to think about school or work for a little bit. Go ahead and just and relax, enjoy, and do some other things. Well, it's good your schedule allows you to do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a, you know, a lot of pile in the bank. Use a little bit of it here and there. Right, you know? right. Yeah, for us, uh, this week is the uh, Road to Convention. So, road to Convention. Interesting. Yeah, so I've had to, so I've been clearing most of my weekly weekly stuff once we end the latter part of the week for a convention. Because, yeah. again, it's going to help out. Like, I always volunteer and help out. I just don't think I'm going to do any of the evening activities and whatnot Thursday and Friday. I'm a little over those shenanigans. Yeah, no, conventions can be tiring, but, you know, it's uh, it's, it's something to get you away from work. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a change of pace, and it's, it's kind of one of those habit things, but um, I don't know why I lost my train of thought again. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing that a lot. I, it's all I guess good, it shows I'm yeah. tired. Well, it's all good. Are you it's sure all good, but I can... Tired. Tired, but yes, and here's why I'm saying that. <laughs> I've actually decided to really double down on the fact that I want to get past that 380 pound line, and the only way I'm gonna do that is if I, you know, stop screwing around and actually take serious control of my diet. So I have, I think I've maybe had 12 or 18 ounces of Mountain Dew since Sunday. Well, that's good. So Less than normally, the normally I'm doing like at least a couple of cans or a couple of bottles a day. Even, even in my cup where I have it's ice, and then I pour the Mountain Dew in, and I let I mix it with water. But I've been doing that. I've been trying to seriously cut out the carbs. And seriously that's a big thing. Cut yeah, you out cut out the start. carbs, cut out the calories. Go into zero drinks. No more quesadillas so. for them or burritos. No, you can. It's oh, just yeah. a matter of uh, keeping it minimized. But the big, the big, the big thing is the whole. Some people need to turn off their notifications, like I'm about to do. Bah, bah, bah. do, 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 do. But uh, do. yeah, um, no, it's just uh, like my dad was over hanging out the other day, and we went to lunch. Okay. And it was like, okay, where do we want to go to lunch? Well, you know, got Cindy's down here at, at the food at the food place, and it's like burritos and stuff. And he's like, he he can't do that. He's doing on a very, he's he's work he's working on a very keto centric style of diet yeah, where it's like a, here here here's like a, a, a bucket of carbs you can have for the day the keto so, diet is really is really a very uh food inducing you know it lowers down that count but it is effective depending on how focused you are on it well given 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 the way we are in society with how much stuff is so processed and carb based it's like it's really hard to get away from it. like i'm trying to get away from Cutting out all the bread, cutting yeah. out all the pasta. I mean, I've got a thing of zucchini noodles I bought at the grocery store to use with spaghetti because yeah. we have a thing coming up uh, the next time Teens on Parade are here. Yeah. Well, the, they couldn't decide between chili, lasagna, and spaghetti, and I'm like, wait a minute, all three of those have the same base. Yes. Well, let's make all three. Yeah. Use and that zucchini noodles. Well, we're going to do a, a test before that. And the okay. other thing is, like, I have that KitchenAid mixer. And, you know, the KitchenAid's like the Swiss Army knife of kitchen appliances. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? But they've got an attachment for making noodles out of zucchini and squash. And it's like, well, let me make sure I like this before I invest the 70, 80 ar left arm, right arm thing for this. Yeah. So, but it's just trying to do all that, mm. revamping. Like, I, I, I do a membership to a food... Uh, a menu planning thing called eat this much okay and it's really nice because it allows you to pick and choose foods like and they've really ramped it up over the last year where you have different um diets you want to consider and some of the newer things they added in like different food categories and sure sure enough somebody sat there and spent the time to input the taco bell menu and the mcdonald's menu so you could add those because it'll give you like a you, you pick what day you're going to do your grocery shopping yeah and it'll give you your menu and all your grocery list and everything else and if you're in one of those places that takes uh takes advantage of the new amazon fresh yeah delivery service you can take a look at that 
click the button and your entire grocery list or a meal requirement list all goes to Amazon Fresh and then you can have it delivered. That's really good. Amazon Downside is, is, is uh... where we are, I don't qualify for Amazon Fresh yet. Oh, yeah. I bet it covers a lot of Virginia Beach. I really haven't checked. I know yeah. because of Whole Food. Yeah, I know Whole be, Foods. You got to be in a certain Virginia range Beach. for Whole Food, and then it would work out right. Oh yeah. Um, there's another thing called Instacart, which yeah. is again kind of an ordering thing, which connects to a few places. But with most every grocery store doing this, doing this thing where they, it's like, hey, I put in my grocery list, and you guys pull it off the counter, put it in the bags, and I'll just come pick it up and pay for it. Yeah, with all the stores having that like a drive-by kind of thing. Everyone from Target to Walmart to yeah. all the grocery stores, it makes it easier for shopping. But, you know, it does help out with people on the go. Oh, it's, we're, we're, everybody's so go, 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 and all this and that. It's like, okay, I got to set aside two hours a week or two hours yeah. every couple of weeks to go, go grocery shopping. That's two hours I get to be doing something else. Yeah. Well, in my, yeah. Li- <laughs> or in my life, it's two well, hours well, I could be, you know. Taking those hours and venturing out and doing other things. Yeah. Like, I ventured out and did a lot of things this weekend. Oh really? With those extra days. Oh yeah. Well, tell me about it. I've been I've been um, rambling on for know, all this you... time talking about diet and all that stuff. Hey, and it's like, well, let's reverse the diet and add in some drinking, because that's what I did over the weekend. Okay. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> kind of dieting. Oh well, yeah. I mean, I I had soup. I had I had a potato. Depending on what you're drinking. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, I went, there was a. I remember <clears throat> reading an article years ago. Um, I think it was in Men's Health magazine, uh, where. They actually record. They actually had a list of beers that was good post workout, just because of the calorie calories for that for post workout recovery. I'm gonna need that list. I'm gonna do some searching. <laughs> but yeah, so but I found it very very fascinating. <laughs> that is very fascinating because there is beers with very low calorie count, so it does it is a plus. So well, this was also like you know if you do if you do if you're doing like um. Like you do a big a big run, like a, one of those big five Ks, ten or marathons, you know. Obviously, there's a reason why there's a beer tent afterwards. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> what the the Shamrock Fest. You know, you you run that ten eight K, and then you'll be drinking beer the rest of the you know yeah, afternoon. Well, well the, and that's part of why I'm really trying to push this because yeah. talking with my trainer, if I get under three hundred, that would be a good team to start getting back into the running. Oh yeah, so definitely. If you I start getting get... into that, then we can do some five Ks. Oh yeah. Five Ks, eight Ks, then marathon. I still want to try and do an ultra. I don't know what that is, but it sounds really tiring. An ultra, uh, for anybody who wants to call me insane now, is a one hundred mile trail run. I'll be a yes. fan and a cheerleader for that one. See, I, I well, talked to a couple of trainers. I would like to do an ultra. I'm good at distance. Yeah. I'm not good at sprinting. I am no sprinter. Yeah, I'm more of a distance than sprinter, too. I, I, I've gotten that runner high when I was active duty and actually ran like five, six. And I did do that eight mile one morning because I was bored out of my mind in Kuwait. Yeah. So I ran for eight miles on a broken foot, which probably didn't do me any good retrospectively. But hey. Hey, all hindsight, you know. It's all hindsight, maybe. but yeah, it, I'd like to do an ultra because, you know, doing those kinds of, those kinds, it, it's an alternative sport. Like, obviously, I'm not a baseball player or a football player. But you still want to be able to do some things, running, jogging, jumping, whatever. Yeah, and the thing is, is there's a lot of prep that goes into it, a lot of support staff to do that because it's, it's intense. So, yeah. One day, but uh, they're so. great podcasts I listen to called uh, Trail Running Nation, Trail Runner Nation, where they they every year they talk about some of the various uh, ones, and there's one called Western States out in California that is all through the the Sierra Mountains and whatnot. Definitely looks something to add to a bucket list item, but yeah, before then, and well, up, same uh, thing with like hiking up and down the AT or yeah. the Pacific Trail. Yeah, do the five Ks, eight Ks, then maybe that hundred. Mile, you got to work whatever. up because you yeah. know you got to be able to do a full marathon yeah. and then be like oh I'm going to do a full marathon like three times. One day, one day, but until that day, it's been most of the days drinking on Saturday. All right, so yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm detracting from that. Tell me about your drinking. Well, um, it was pretty much all day drink fest because um, Saturday, um, <laughs> Saturday was the Chesapeake Wine Fest. Okay. So right here down the street from not too far from your house down at the city park. So they had a few vineyards from around the state there. So 
did a little bit of tasting, got a few bottles. Okay. And then right after that, went to a farmhouse brewery to meet up with my cousins. Oh, cool. So, had a couple brews there. Where's Farmhouse Brewery? Farmhouse Brewery is the is the one, it's on Kempsville Road, Kempsville and Centerville. They renovated an old farmhouse. Back Bay uh, Back Bay Brewery renovated an old farmhouse and converted it, and it's called Farmhouse Brewery. So it's been there a little over a year, but it's really, really popular. So it gets Oh, that's packed. actually not too far from here, so oh, yeah. I, I would be willing to venture there. So that was the Saturday evening. Cool. And then the rest of the weekend just pretty much was just chilling and doing stuff you know football monday um went and did top golf once in the you know, first time in a while so that was kind of fun i know g has always been trying to get us to go do that oh yeah i'm, I'm always down you just tell me when and when, you know when and i'll be there as someday. long as i'm off <laughs> someday all right but, um yeah so that was pretty much everything in Quiet corner with the door open. Well, you know, we're, we're in the tavern, so hey, it works out really well. It does. Grab your brew and go. Got a little sign escape, but all right. Tables and chats. Movies. What movie did we see this past weekend? This past weekend, I reviewed, watched and reviewed the new Will Smith sci-fi spy thriller-ish film called Gemini Man, directed by Ang Lee. Ah, yes. Uh, Ang Lee, if for those you know, if it's a name that you recognize, he did um, Brokeback Mountain, The Life of Pi, um, the the failed first Hulk movie, because that was pretty terrible. And even in his own words, he doesn't consider he doesn't think that just because the the film is not a commercial success, oh, yeah. it's not necessarily a failure. Yeah, not in his book, but it's still it was not a very good adaptation of the Hulk. But his other two films. Uh, uh, Brokeback Mountain Life, Life of Pi were very, very great. Oh, yeah. And the reason I bring that up because it lays the foundation for what kind of experience you will have for this film. Okay. Um, basically, what you have with with a director like Ang Lee, he's all about visuals and character. So what this film focuses on, it revolves around a man named Henry Bruggen, which is Will Smith. Um, he's a hitman that works for the U.S. government. Um, he's on his, uh, he does his last mission and decides to retire, but through um, circumstantial plot elements, they, go, they start to go after him. And they try to take out their best hitman ever in the history of the government force. They have to send a younger version of him um, that goes by the name of Junior. So Will Smith plays both characters. Yeah, I, saw, I saw there was some behind the scenes stuff that really... One of the bene- one of the coolest things about this is it's really showcasing how that whole de aging technology yeah. that was the introduced f- in Tron Legacy has really come in the last yeah several they years. use that de aging technology to de age um, Will Smith to look like he was in his early twenties and one of the positive notes of this film is the de aging technology because it looks so genuine and so real you can't really tell the difference when he is. When Will Smith is playing both and look, you know, standing there side by side, you think that's the second person that, you know, like he actually was cloned. Mm-hmm. So, um, what we have here after um, after you get introduced to both, you know, versions of Will, and then he's being chased down by the U.S. government in this younger version of self. Um, the film boils down to being a, a basic on the run spy thriller concept. So. A lot of the film revolves around Will Smith just dodging and weaving through different action sequences and fights, trying to stay alive because of this um, this younger self coming after him and this um, secret agency that's working for the U.S. government that wants to take him out because of, for some whatever reason, knowledge that he has about you know, what they're doing. never really... They not really talk about and stuff. So mm. this film... When I start off the review, I focus on the fact that the, the great thing about cinema is um, is finding those films that are have an original concept, and this mm-hmm. is one of those films with the uh, with you know a year littered through remakes and rehashes and sequels. Not every big film is one of those three, but a lot of films that are popular, a lot of people that navigate to are one of those three. Okay. So whenever there's an original film or something a little bit different, you know, an indie film, a rom com, you know, something that's a little bit different, 
I gravitate to it. I, I want to see it. I want to experience. This is the kind of film people clamor for because people like to complain that there's nothing out there but sequels and remakes. But there, there is. There's like mm. an average of 600 films that get released every year. Not all 600 films are rehashes or remakes. So but when the, the, of those 600, yeah. there's a, a finite percentage. Yeah, there's is that a finite percentage. The pulp culture is going to find and yeah. in that So percentage. when you have a, a, a big name director like Ang Lee and a big actor, Will Smith, that are pulling on the weeds of something original, you want to hope that it, it's good and great or succeeds. Yeah, and from what I heard, this story, this script has been running around Hollywood for the better part of like a decade. Yeah, it's been running around, and you can definitely tell why. Because what outside of the great technology that's being used, the great you know cinematography and action scenes that happen at different parts of the film, um, what ruins this movie is the script itself. It is some of the worst dialogue I've heard in quite some time. Um, sequences don't match up. Uh, plot elements and development just don't make any sense when things happen. And the villain played by Clive Owen is the standard cookie cutter, um, you know, secret mustache, mustache, mustache twirling, you know, secret government agency man. So mm. anytime he shows up on screen, it just makes you just cringe because it r ruins the mood and the themes and the concept of what will smith is dealing with when he has to fight his younger self mm -hmm. so there's a conflict of uh, a, a character dynamic with the idea of the spy thriller concept okay so it just kind of clashes and with that fragmentation and the terrible dialogue it just makes you s see the glaring holes between transitions of scenes the editing just obvious like just plot holes all over the place like one this ain't a spoiler when they're having a confrontation and and will smith older self is talking to the younger self and talking about how he was cloned um and he mentions how far how many years back he was cloned let alone cloning um and being completely identical it tries to throw a scientific explanation into something that's already been explained so it even drives the plot even more into a trajectory of impossible feats so you really just raise your eyebrows like that just doesn't make any sense hmm. so when the film progresses it starts to lose its head between the themes of the the character dynamic between an older and younger self and the acting and starts to get lost in the story so when it gets into the third act it just it just turns into a hot mess it feels like you're just playing a really bad video game at that point okay yeah. so um I'm, I'm, I'm sensing it was definitely on the lower end of the rise scale, but let's uh, let's, let, okay. let's not let's not leave that plot hole. Okay. What let's go. The, okay. Um, what, what what did you so the de aging you liked the de aging the, the 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 direction and the action scenes were great. Will Smith was great in the role because he had to play two versions of himself. Mm -hmm. Outside of the de-aging, he had to play two versions of self. So okay. that was... You and saw you, the strength of the acting come out there. Okay, and what you didn't like was the script and the... The script? Um, what about the overall premise of the story? Did that... The, the premise... Could have been salvageable? The premise is very simplistic to the point to where they stretched it beyond what it should have been. So they, they try to add deeper meaning to a simple spy thriller story. So that's that's where a lot of the dialogue feels terrible because when they're speaking, they're trying to add deeper meaning to a simp uh, simple conversation. So sounds like the sounds like you have all the you have most of the right things. It's just the script needs yeah. to be rewritten. But yeah, the, yeah, the, <laughs> the, pretty much the the script and the dialogue just ruins the movie, okay. including the th the third act because you could tell in the third act. They were just throwing, throwing everything at the screen just to make you, you know, visual noise. And you could tell they were running, running low on budget because the CGI was starting to show. All right. So, in the end, what are we calling it? Um, because of because of all the convoluted mess that surrounds the 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 little bit of stuff that was great, I gave it a two point five out of five. Um, it's not worth seeing at the theater. You can, if you want to, save it for a Friday night at home. All right, so I'll look forward to be on the 99-cent rental. There you go. Okay.
Yeah. That, that, and it's uh, just to add a little top in the cake. It really, it really hurts it when you see an original film attempt to, you know, attempt something, but they just fall flat because they don't try to do anything else. Oof. So this really hurts the idea of the studios investing in original films because you throw the money at it and then it doesn't make the money or get any of the accolades. No critic, good critic reception, no good audience reception, and you're not making the money in the weekend. Why does a studio want to invest in something original when they can invest in a Marvel property that's going to at least get you $500 million first weekend? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> that's just a tidbit. That kind of hurts, you know, for cinephiles out there like me that like to see original indie films. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. So, next up we have some, uh, you did finish the TV series. So I is that did a, finish is that, the TV uh, series. Are we going to end on a private note? On a, uh, not a private note, but a positive note on our reviews Maybe. this week? Maybe. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's add a little Speaking bit of Speaking of sprinkle. spy thrillers and whatnot. Transition to another spy uh, show, um, Jack Ryan on um, Amazon on Prime, Amazon right? Prime, a Tom Clancy property. Yeah. So it's an uh, it's an eight episode series, and it focuses on the titular character that's played by John Krasinski. And the premise of the first season is that he's a CIA analyst that's that's uncovered the, um, these um, transactions that lead to um, an extremist named Suleiman who is plotting against the West. So very standard cookie cutter kind of outline for a spy thriller, but what makes this show very tantalizing is the character dynamic as you watch the characters evolve through the season. Okay. So as you watch Jack Ryan and the the enemy Suleiman, you watch their their characters evolve into their roles as both CIA agent and as the the, the terrorist leader of this group from Syria. So, what the show does, it focuses on the what and the why. Well, why are we trying to uncover the plot, and why is Suleiman doing these things against the West? And being a TV series, it allows more time for backstories to, you know, slowly lift the veil hmm. on both the characters and all the, you know, ancillary characters that surround them. So all the characters in the CIA, you know, CIA. Um, the government, you know, some, you know, family members, some other terrorist people that work with Suleiman and his family. So you get to see a more human element to both sides. So it's not just the good versus bad. You see, you have a, um, a hazing of morality between both. Because what you see from episode to episode with um, Jack Ryan being led by his, um, um, his uh, director, James Greer... You, you see a conflict of morality, whereas Jack Ryan is very, you know, strong, fast on doing the right thing, where his director is, you're going to have to bend the rules sometimes to get the information you need. So there's episodes where they have to get the... They're trying to find where Suleiman is so they can capture him, but if they go by the book, they're not going to find him. So there's a few episodes where they go beyond the book to get the information they need to find this guy. To uncover the plot before he sets off a bomb in uh, the United States. Okay, well, the, I mean, this is a pretty uh, heavy franchise. Yeah, it's a pretty heavy franchise. So it has a very a his, it has a lot of history because of the books and previous you know films that been that are part of the series. So what I liked about it is the the, the world be- building, the character depth that you give to both sides. And the understanding that morality is, is, is a choice regardless of which side you're on. Okay. I like that. I like yeah. how Amazon's really kind of nailing this yeah. series. With, so it really makes that. you, especially like like going back to like the boys, you know, it, it puts that morality choice on what is a hero. So it does the same thing here where, you know, it puts a morality choice. It's like, yes, uh, the United States and the West are trying to stop, you know, bad things from happening. But why are these people doing this? Mm-hmm. And that's what, that's the element that is missing from a lot of very standard action films when they do the bad guys. They just make them the bad guys. But why? This series, with it being eight episodes, it gives them enough time to um, explain that why. Okay. And there is a reason why. And it makes you kind of, kind of, kind of just think back to you know decisions that people make in the past and like re- the reason they are doing this is because you did that 10 20 years ago 
Okay. So what would you? So what's our rating for this? Okay. One? Um, based on that, um, um, since it is a spy thriller, there's a very, there, it's a very um, systematic way of how it does things. So there's mm-hmm. a ver- there's a lot of like last second saves, um, unforeseen twists that happen. You know, the the bad guy always escapes until the very end, and then eventually they get caught. You know, red handed. So because of the, the some of the little standardness that happened. I would give it a four out of five. Okay. Because it is a very good series, um, but you know, but it's not. It's so not. If you have Amazon, if you have right? Amazon Prime, I would recommend watching out. it. I would recommend watching it for anybody that's a fan of good spy thrillers and good character character drama okay. stories because that's okay. what it does. Nice. So. Definitely, oh, um, and season two is about to drop. So. Oh yeah, you're all caught up, ready for. Yeah, I'm ready. That's another reason I try to steam past through this. So. Gotcha. There's a few more series down the pipeline, so hopefully I'll have another series or two to talk about. Alrighty, so. We got our man. Alrighty. With the plan. Our state of game. There is a state. Alrighty. Full of games. <laughs> well, we'll kick this off with the uh, video game up story progression updates. And that's all you right now. Cause okay. I haven't done it. Yeah, no, I'm no. still trying to find a day to video game. But... Oh, yeah. Um, still working my way through Borderlands 3, still having where one you of at, a lifetime. Where, where are you at now in the story? Um, right now, I had to take out some... I had to get the, the, the second of... Uh, there's three artifacts you have to get. I've mm-hmm. gotten the second one. So I've done that, and I've done a few side missions, so I haven't really progressed the main story yet. I did the side mission so I can get more weapons. Okay. Because... Anybody that plays Borderlands know it's all about the weapons. Oh yeah. So yeah, I got some uh, some some really awesome weapons now. I have this pistol that shoots radiation bullets. So yeah, so when you're shooting the radiation bullets, it just overcharges the people. So they not only like they get hit damage from the bullet, but it's you know over time, they 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 blow up and die. Nice. Um, and I also have um, a um, an ass- assault rifle that shoots electricity. Ooh, cool. No, the uh, rephrase that. Not just shoot electricity, but it flips between assault rifle and shotgun mode. <laughs> so yes, I'm looking forward to using that gun out on the battlefield. Oh lordy! So I'm slowly progressing through the story of Borderlands Three. So the next thing is to go after that third artifact. Um, I'm also playing Division Two. Uh, started okay. playing that with uh, with my brother. So I'm coaching him through because uh, he hasn't played the game in a while. So he has to get used to all the mechanics. Yeah. So. Doing that, and also I wanted to get a touch on the racing side, so I decided to play a little for Forza Horizon Four. What do you think of it? So far, I haven't gotten too far, but I can tell you that the weather dynamics is legit in that game. So That's I'm great. looking forward to seeing how bad I drive in the snow whenever I have to drive in the snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if I I think I have I think I play I think I have that one too, and it's it's, it's definitely fun. Yeah. And I'll eventually get back to Devil May Cry 5, but right now, Borderlands 3 all the way. Okay. Well, for me, I have a couple of... I didn't get any video game time in, aside from uh, some mobile games, uh, which is just, you know, wasting time while I'm waiting on something to get done. It was... Uh, had two uh, tabletop sessions and some airsoft time. Um... So first one is we have our monthly group where we get together and we call it, this group is the uh, Go Go Happy Time, we're calling it. Go Go Happy Time. What, what's the Go Go with the happy time? Well, this is the group that we're playing uh, Warhammer 40K Wrath and Glory. Okay. Um, in this episode, or scene, uh, we'd uh, accepted this job to go to and retrieve this package from uh, one of the other races, which is Tau. And while we're traveling there, we come across this insectoid race called Tyranids. Think Swarm from StarCraft. <laughs> right? Yeah, I know and Swarm. we had a, a couple ship-to-ship battles, um, and then we got to the planet where this package was. We go to retrieve the package and then get 
assaulted by four different mobs of Tyranids. And we got through that, and the, episode, our, the, ep the session ended with us getting back on the ship and lifting off into orbit with this package, which is a Tyranid of some type that we have to take back. And we're debating on, okay, do we augment this thing with uh, Necron technology? Do we bring back just a body? Yeah. Or do we use this for our own nefarious ends? It's hard to tell. This group is uh, this group is a little chaotic. But um, and then Sunday was the Agents of Short. Which Best I, know, in the world. I, I know I know you're you, you're loving this story. Yes, I am. I'm loving the the Agents of Short story. <laughs> so our our agents have uh are still looking for a nimble right which set off a, a fireball in the center of town okay or in this little town area of town near our particular establishment so we're still trying to find that and then apparently the nimble rights master a uh, lady Groudon, uh, i call her really lady growlith because i couldn't quite catch the enunciation she uh has disappeared we're trying to <laughs> find so we use our network of street urchins yeah to uh locate and find well we we do get a lead and we do come across the nimble right and one of our party happens to very convincingly uh roll roll well on a on a persuasion convince the nimble right to not attack us and to just tell tell us the location of this stone which leads to a vault okay right hence the name of the, the dra water deep dragon heist is this dragon vault is what we're trying to find so this it's a map that leads us to a windmill that was converted into a butcher shop. Okay. All right. So we go there, and it's the middle of the night because obviously we can't do anything during the day. Um, so we go in the middle of the night and we essentially break in and start searching the windmill for the stone, and we find rooms and rooms of squatters and the butcher. Well. We couldn't figure out what, where this thing was, so we decided, well, well, you know, we'll cause a distraction, we'll get the butcher to wake up, and then, you know, we'll act like we're assist, we're there to assist him to reclaim order, and the butcher decides to attack us instead, and a fight breaks out. He ends up lo he ends up going, he, he ends up, we, we end up winning, we take him back inside to interrogate him. Okay. And this is funny, because it's like, I, my character has been dubbed the lawyer of the group you're the one that does the debating oh that and it's like it's some of the things i've said i've said to try and get us out of situations the d uh penumbra has been like that's really good uh yeah and then we're looking at the acquisitions incorporated stuff and there's a subclass called the documancer okay and this is that person that handles all the documents all the contracts okay. everything so I'm kind of taking that role as our in, in the in the agents. Okay. So we now have a new lead, which we're going to track down in our next session. Okay. But it's it's going well. There was some definite shenanigans, like uh, one of our characters we call him the captain, and uh, turns out his uh, first mate on his ship, which is in port, his first mate is a dragonborn who likes to disguise himself as a cobalt. So another small race. <laughs> and the crew is, of the ship is all cobalts. Funny. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it's like, okay, well, you know, it's in his contract. He gets to have a cobalt on a stick whenever he wants. That's why the ship's all cobalts. <laughs> <laughs> so good job. Yeah, the hilarity ensues with that. Um, and then Sunday, or before Agents of Short, Sunday actually went out to. Bellhack, and instead of marshalling or chrono or doing any of that, I actually played. Running and gunning. I did. Uh, definitely the the working on the running part, but definitely it was a uh, moving and gunning. Well, a half a day, and it's like you know I really want to get out and play. I mean, yeah. I've been doing work on my rifle, doing work on my kit, and it's like I need to. I can look at it, and it's like, oh, this looks great. This looks great, but I need to actually get out and use it to see. Okay, is this actually going to work? <laughs> So, we get out, so I get out there, and of course, half a day, so it was all the warm-up games. Now, I used to be, I couldn't last all the warm-up games. I'd have to stop and sit for a whole game before I'd get back into it. 
This time, no. I actually played the entire first round, came back for Hydrate Reload, and then we did an uh, attack and defense scenario, which was, which it was based, and this is the one where I had the most fun because I was, and I got myself really involved in it, is you have your uh, attackers and defenders. The attackers have to retrieve a high value target from the defenders and bring it back to the L from the town to the LZ and then to be extracted. Well, when I went with the defending side, we got out to town and then the, the GA asked, okay, who's going to, we need to have someone be the HVT. Okay. I said, I'll do it. So I got taped up with the uh, blue tape and red tape to symbolize I was the HVT. And then it was like, we went into the tower, which was a big three story, uh, four, it's actually a four-story repelling tower, but the fourth story has been locked off forever. Imaginary. Yeah, it doesn't... It, Imaginary. It, it, it does you can exist. see it, but you can't touch it. It's um, just, during, during the morning in Greece, that was always the joke. He goes, there are two buildings there. There's a two-story and a three-story. Someone, of course, raised their hand, but it's four-story. He goes, that is just imaginary. You cannot see that. It does not exist. <laughs> it's a really cool repelling tower. but That's cool. But yeah, so I went up, I was in the third story, third story of the tower, and that's where I hung out. And we actually held our own for the majority of the game. At the last 15 minutes or so, the attackers found me. And the, one of the attackers actually shot me in the back, and then realized I was the target. So it was walk me down, because you can't heal in the tower. Walk me down out of the tower, and then I had to, and then pretty much we jogged. Right, as the best of my ability, jogged back to the LZ okay. for the extraction. But it was really fun because I was really involved and I actually got some good gameplay. That's One of good. them, we had a force on force where everybody had to try and take the Escher, which is the two story building. And I came up and I actually got to an area and was actually able to lay down some cover for people. And then, but then I got hit and that spent the rest of that session kind of just standing there talking with people and then it's like realizing that difference it's like oh i play but then i marshal and i pl now i play differently because i marshal yeah <laughs> which i enjoy and now we're uh just counting down to z to zombie that's going to be fun with all those uh, zombies out there i'm so looking forward to it z is going to be should be a lot of fun counting down um definitely like I said, it's like I said in the brief, Guy, all day zombie, come dressed up. If you And, and getting hit isn't so bad because, again, these the, the stuff out there isn't terrible. But just to have people, you know, come out and bring out their best zombie kind of regalia, it's like, it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> topics today a lot of random ones well, not well, randoms but some big some big ones well the first thing is we'll get into our get into our we got a couple of new couple of news things so want to do our new we'll, we'll go through those and the first one is hot off the press hot sizzling because uh a few mo we've talked about two of the apple press conferences and oh yeah to show our due diligence for those people who don't use apple um, <laughs> There's a lot of people that don't use Apple. That's true. That's true. Well, I didn't realize. I didn't know that these happened. To, and this is just my ignorance. But you know, I'm glad I would learn something new. And that was Google had a press conference today. Yes, they did. They had a press conference to reveal a lot of their new uh, tech items coming out. And I like how it's actually it was East Coast time centric. Yeah, that's because a, a lot of the times when they have these uh, press conferences, it's always. In LA or somewhere out yeah. west, so you gotta adjust course no matter. Oh yeah, where they'll you. do it at 10 a.m. But for you, it's like one in the afternoon. Yeah. But yeah, so Google had a press event today. It was actually really good. Did you uh, get a chance to watch it? Uh, uh, I did not get a chance to watch it, but I heard about some of the big things. To, oh yeah, they hit. Out. They talked about the all of their new stuff, um, and of course, one of the big announcements was the Google Pixel 4 phone. Which has some and some interesting new tech to it. So, um, what are some of the interesting tech that you heard out of the conference for that? Well, probably the most fascinating thing to me is this is uh, the first phone with a built-in uh, radar 
element to it. And radar is uh, tracking of some sort? Mm-hmm. Okay. Just, just, just radar in its simplest definition is what you're thinking. Because um, a lot of the new, like the, the Google, the uh, Nest devices, yeah. like, obviously I do, for my house, I do a lot of the uh, Amazon yeah. devices. Well, there's a an Amazon device where it's like basically a, a screen um, that you can that you can watch videos on and interact with. Well, Google had made something similar. Uh, it's all in their new Nest uh, Nest devices. Because a few weeks ago we talked about how Google was revamping their whole yeah, smart they, home stuff. They were revamping the smart home and just leaving stuff in the wayside. Well, yeah. Part of what they were doing is they were restructuring everything. To be instead of someone going device by device, it was trying to find a whole home solution to have it all work together. Like they revamped their spots, they revamped their the studio thing, the, the monitor thing. Well, and with the phone is also it's like the they have this new Wi-Fi router uh, spot uh, point to create a nested a netted Wi-Fi as well as improve routing with a router that literally that updates itself and it's like okay sure i'm trying to think it's like yeah i have a router provided by my cable provider so adding another router uh, whatever but as i was saying the radar technology is like they do more like the the hand motions yeah like you can actually instead of touching the device yeah. you just wave your hand in front of it to stop or get it to... It's one of the things I saw that they, they talked about on the Google Pixel 4 was that motion sense. So well, other things, and, gestures. And that's that's where the radar chip comes yep. in. Um, Soli, I think it was the project name, where they were trying to develop this whole concept of incorporating radar into the phone. And they do... They do it, it's really fascinating in the sense that it's like, okay, your phone is playing. Instead of touching your phone to pause or go to the next track, yeah. you just wave your hand in front of it and it'll skip the track or progression of technology but uh and the radar chip is actually about the size of your fin of your pinky finger that's pretty cool well yeah it took them a while because their first one was like you know freaking like this by this or whatever but and then they got it down to like the pinky size and put it and put it into the phone and the other thing they were saying like it helps with the like the facial recognition because that's a new thing on a lot of new phones well you have to in order to use to use that you got to pick up the phone tap the screen to get to start booting up well yeah. with this radar chip and this whole motion just, sense it, technology it just senses it the minute you get your hand gets close to the phone to pick it up it's already spooling up those things to do that so that i think is going to be interesting um they have some uh did do some camera revamp yeah um one of the nice things with the press conference they had a professional photographer they gave the pixel to and let her kind of play with it but uh, they they went with a, they have a couple of cameras in there and they focused more on the telephoto lens and then we we're talking about how they upgraded the camera technology and the like the like when you set your pictures like they have the HDR setting or whatever mm -hmm. well so some of the limitations with current HDR is when you go and you're setting up your shot and your shot's going to look different because this, your your viewfinder isn't rendering it in the HDR. Well, with the Pixel 4, it will yeah. render HDR before you as you compose your yeah. shot. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the tidbits pulled out here from IGN's article, they said the pinch zooming provides a clearer image than cropping the same image zoomed yes. up, which builds upon upon that you know improvement with the camera zooms and stuff. Yeah, he was a, just actually guy focused a lot on that. He actually sat there and says like, look. As you're composing the shot, pinch and zoom, you'll get a higher resolution picture. Okay. And also, uh, they have some decent price points for this. Uh, I don't remember catching okay. them, so what did you say? So, see? Pixel 4 uh, for the 64 gig is, um, is uh, $799. And so, Pixel 4. Wow, that was a... Uh... <laughs> that, Somebody came walking in. That bar, man. Where's that bar at? I need some of that drinking right there. But no, he's sitting there. <laughs> Ooh, bar. But that's a play the rewind button. A Pixel Four, a sixty-four gigabyte, going to be seven ninety-nine. A hundred twenty-eight gigabyte, eight ninety-nine. The Pixel Four XL, the sixty-four is going to be eight ninety-nine, and the one twenty-eight is going to be nine ninety-nine. So 
decent, you know. 128 gonna... gig though. Yeah. I mean, mm. I would I would stick with the four. I don't like the bigger phones. So if I were to get a Pixel, I'd probably get that 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 maybe that 128 because it'd be the same size of my Galaxy S9. I figured it would have been like up in the uh, higher memory. Oh yeah, but it is a the the one thing that Google ha has is like anything you save store it can go right up to the cloud oh, automatically. True. So right to your Google Drive, everything saves straight to your Google Drive. Well, Apple does that too with their iCloud okay. Drive. So there's um, it seems to be pretty standard tech. I, uh, another big thing from mm -hmm. the Google press conference, they talked about their uh, pseudo game system. Yes. So they did. Uh, they did reveal. Stadia. They did reveal a release date for the Founders Edition. Um, as reported on IGN, November nineteenth, twenty nineteen. So next month, you'll be able to get your hands on Google Stadia, if uh, the Founders Edition. So yeah, that seems interesting because the whole idea is to have take away the hardware loading time. Yeah. So they want to centralize <laughs> everything within within like a cloud base. So what Google is Google is trying to do is get you know try to do something completely different than what the the, the main market is out there with the you know you have Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo. Yeah. Everything's console based. Even when they're you know you're connected and you're online playing and stuff, Google's doing the reverse course where it's like there's no hardware. It's all cloud based and software. You just pay for access. It's a browser plugin, and you'll have access to, supposedly to a lot of these. HD game, so everything from like um, Red Dead Redemption 2 to Mortal Kombat 11. One of the prime games that they're getting next year is Cyberpunk 2077. So they're hoping to book on that one. Well, you know, this sounds really great. Uh, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to take it. It does sound really. It great. sounds great, but I've given my opinion on this a while back on the podcast, and I still think that it's going to be a hard sell for a lot of people that have already invested time and money into either Microsoft, Sony, and even PC Master Race. You have a lot of you have a chunk of gamers in all this. So maybe they're trying to wedge their their name into maybe that that casual gamer market that doesn't want to invest so much so they can just pay for this and grab the controller and go cuz it's browser based. Yeah. I I I think and I one of the things I think is just this sounds really good until you run into the fact that this is relying on a connection to a server. Yes. Which means varying ISPs, varying quality of signal, and then not so much just Google servers, but also the local servers for the ISP that route the traffic back and forth. So I think there are some elements there that while this sounds really good, this is something that I think he needs to take into account. I don't know if you're going to get quite as good a performance as they're advertising. Yeah, they're really they're really aiming big with it. I mean, cloud based is great, except and as long as the connection is solid. Would you agree? I mean, you you do a lot of stuff with hosting and whatever. It's like ho hosting is great, yeah. but if your connection's crap. But the one thing is, you're paying for the subscription, and then you're also paying for the games. It's not completely yeah. free the the key is that it brings up to me is the shadow the Have shadow of that um shadow boxes or shadow i believe it's called shadow i cannot remember the exact name of them but it's a company what they do is they have a server farm out in some Wherever. place and what you do is you get this little box a little square box they send it to your house you hook it up to your monitor and keyboard and everything and that connects to your box that's in their Oh, I've heard of box. that. I remember hearing about that. Now, it's the same thing. Your connection depends on that. Yeah. They say that the lag is pretty good, but there is going to be some latency between it. Yeah. You can't stop it, and that's the same thing I'm thinking with this. There's no way to really stop the latency. Yeah, this, this Google it. Stadia is all about investment of the future. Yeah. Because... You you're going to have to wedge into generations of, of gamers to ch have them change their mindset from having a console, regardless of it's plugged in to online and stuff. But if you lose that connection, you can still play offline. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. You can still play your your shooter, your RPG, your whatever it is offline. So mm -hmm. like to a, a degree, yeah, to a degree. Yeah. But the thing is, is that you have huge bases, and I'll reiterate, huge bases that's invested in 
Microsoft, in Sony, in the PC, and you want to try to wedge your name into it now, it's yeah. going to be a hard sell. Yeah, I agree. And but it's something I think there's one of the beauty of beauty of competition and, and the market we have is we will see yeah. how this goes. I competition mean, helps. Steam tried the same thing. Similar they tried a very similar if not same thing with their Steam box and that didn't it well their Steam box, to be clarified, is not a cloud based. It still uses your computer. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a true cloud base. What that does is it connects to your computer that's in your local network. Which you now you can do which computer. now you can do with both PlayStation and Xbox. Mm -hmm. The same thing. So I think it'll be I, I'm I mean, curious to see. I'd love to get my hands on it to see yeah. how well it performs. I'm gonna wait and see approach because with with you know, I invest in the consoles I have, you invest in what you have and yeah. You know, we have our other friend over here that invests into his PC Master Race. Why got, should why should we even yeah. why should we even dabble into to this? To be honest, option? if Stadia allows me, allows me to connect to my Steam library, I might be good with that because I have dozens. You're uh, not the only one. I have a lot of games. On a lot Steam of games too. I've never even gotten to on Steam because of various things. But um, regardless of that, moving on. <laughs> what's on the deck? All right, Captain. So, doing work in the shop and whatnot, rearranging the shop, I found myself with a bench. A bench? A, a bench that I, I plan to tear down and repurpose, but okay. the con, the space is, it's kind of undesignated. So, I put a question out to the Balhack uh, community page asking what type of tools... Actually, let me. I'll, I'll just read it. So I found myself with an undesignated table in my shop, and I that I think would make a good tech armorer's bench. My question is, what kinds of tools and supplies would be good for this? So putting it out there, because getting into, I'm, I'm about two years into airsoft. Yeah. I mean, they just recently realized this. I'm about two two years into it, and listening to the various people who've been around a while and some of the tech conversations like okay you know working on working on them is just as important or just as interesting and fascinating it's a lot yeah. like anything any a lot of other hobbies where it's like oh i can customize my car or i can customize my pc or yeah. you know whatever so i wanted to get some opinions from people in the community um and make sure i'm, I'm getting more airsoft related topics because i do we do talk about that just like we talk about movies and games and some of the responses I got back were really kind of fascinating because as a as an aspiring maker, yeah, a lot of these suggestions did not feel out of place in any shop that does make that does maker type things because makers work on a variety of, of materials to do a variety of things, whether it's woodworking, metallurgy, uh, circuitry, whatnot. And so a lot of the suggestions and just a few, a few of the really good ones I got was like um, a magnet on a stick for bolts and screws, a soldering iron, a heat gun, uh, various sizes of calipers and, and what and trays and bins. And it, it was really fascinating. It's like I'm thinking it seems like I have most of that already. Yeah, I was I'd be honest, I was thinking maybe people are going to say, oh, you need an armorer's wrench or to really be a... And it's like, nope, didn't come up. And it's like, I know that's a specialty tool because yeah. like every, every industry has a like specialty tool. And But it's like this one is like, no, you need a, a, a Dremel. Um, I probably, probably the most specialized thing in this list I've seen is an actual chronograph and a trap. Well, I have the trap. Okay. A uh, trap, basically a bin you can shoot BBs in, and then you know, but an actual chronograph to so you can check and check your FPS and make sure you're within your field specs. But I don't know. I thought I thought it was very interesting, just the whole concept of like when you're getting into a hobby and thinking about how you're going to work on that hobby. Like imagine when you got into photography and you started buying cameras. It was like okay. Where am I gonna? Where am I gonna? Where am I gonna tweak my camera in the sense that oh, yeah. okay, different lenses and, and and whatnot. Yeah, when I got into, you had to figure out what kind of uh, lenses I needed for certain shots, depending on if I was doing a photo shoot or shooting out in nature. 
you know, you're just shooting, you know, just within, you know, within the public sphere, you know, capturing the candid moments. So you have to have different lenses for different, you know, different types and also different times of day. Oh, keep sorry, it building, great. keep it going. Yeah. So, I mean, but it was, the, the point was, it was a, I reach out to the community to try to help get some, uh, some feedback yeah. to, and I told them I would use the responses for an upcoming episode. Yeah. So a week later, I use the, ep- I use the yeah, stuff. So I'm trying to build that trust. Build that trust. They give a, uh, give topic ideas and ways, but it also gives another, another, uh, addition to your hobby. Yes. Like I really need more. Hey, but at least it tells me I have more. more. I, I, I have. I don't have to. I have a few less tools to buy and <laughs> yes. just to refine in my black hole. <laughs> just keeps the mind flowing and going. Yeah. Oh yeah, I love it. So. Lots of oddities. You got a some... lot of them. Oh a yeah. A lot of them. It always it always ends up that way, you know. So. What's that voice of the audience? Nothing. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, first thing, first thing in the list, which should make you happy. Voice of the audience. Um, for our odds and ends, is uh, Steam is adding online play to all local multiplayer games. That is very, uh, very, a uh, very big thing because one, Steam has a huge library of games, so adding online play to a lot of there the variety. Hundred and thirty. Five of them, I believe, is the count. Last count for um, because what this does is it um, like you're playing some of the old like StarCraft games, mm-hmm. and you play a local game, yeah. meaning your local network. Well, this actually takes that to a new level, where you can go to local player and still play with everybody online, because some of these games are only local player yeah. or local co-op. Yeah, split screen. So, but yeah, it's a, I, found, I pulled that up in the article. Uh, this is an article from uh, PC Ma- PC Magazine. Uh, Steam currently lists 927 games under the local multiplayer tag. Okay. 373 of those are classed as four-player local. 327 are local co-op. And 257 are just co-op. So clearly this is... I mean, literally... Clearly, there's a lot of games that could benefit from remote play together. But keep so. note that this does not get released until October 21st. Which is not and that it's it's far, not too away. far away. It's only a couple weeks. We're, ta- we're, we're, talking, weeks. Ne- we're, we're, we're talking, when we sit well, down and have our next weekly chat, also, this will be in the wild. But it'll also be in beta. It's not in the live. So if you're on Steam, you have to flip your Steam player over to beta. Well, that's, you know, that doesn't take too too yeah. hard to do. No, that's that's going to be mm-hmm. easy enough. But yeah, it like it is going to be a benefit because like like you said, adding online play to anything that has multiplayer, it just opens up the floodgates for more enjoyment and battering rams of anchor mm-hmm. gamers out there. I think he had posted in here. And happy gamers too. But, oh yeah, yeah, our next thing is a uh, PS5 versus Project Scarlet. Project Scarlet and PS5. So we have an article from IGN uh, talking about preliminary based on just what we're hearing, what the differences are so, between yeah. the two. So, yeah, yeah based on all uh, the information that has been provided both from Microsoft and Sony, they, uh, IGN put together a little chart of a comparison of different um, you know, release dates, different specs, different yada, yada, yada of what you would expect uh, tech-wise when you're looking at these systems. Most of these things, the casual gamer ain't going to get care. It's just going to be a matter of um, what's the name of the system, how much it is, and when is it going to come out. So, like, pretty much the top thing is most gamers are going to be like, oh, it gets released 2020, that's all they care about. Um, but all the stuff that for us tech geek out there, when you're skimming down the list, um, everything seems like it's not really going to be a big, big, big difference. Well, so, a couple of things just looking at the list, and these are just from a technophile. Yeah. Is uh, the GPU, the, the GPUs, the CPUs, but the RAM. We've already, we already know that Scarlet's going to have uh, GDDR6 RAM. We don't know what's going to be in the PS5 yet. Um, also, I'm going to assume, I mean, this is just an assumption, it's going to be equivalent or, you know, somewhere around the same. I, well, most everything else is pretty much the yeah. same, so... But what what... 
yeah and another every... the other two things is the backwards compatibility we know that it's going to be backwards compatible ps4 and playstation vr um scarlet we don't know how far back uh, it'll be compatible nothing's been really not not everything's been confirmed yeah it's never and it's not been concrete but they've said that they're going all the way back to og xbox they well, just don't know how many games yeah and then we have our streaming game service yeah there's the Xbox Project X Cloud, and then we d- and then replo- remote play to be announced. But yeah, it's like when you're looking at the list, this plays into the fact that the further we move into the generations of these new consoles, the closer and closer they're going to get. And the fact that most of the games are multi-platformed, and now crossplay is becoming a bigger, bigger, bigger thing. Mm-hmm. And now it's just going to be a matter of choice. It's yeah. just it's just going to be a matter of, do you want to invest your time in Microsoft's new console or in uh, Sony's new console, and it just depends on the person themselves, you know, and the the community of people they play with. Do you have majority of uh, of uh, you know people that you play with on Microsoft's Xbox? Do you have more people playing on PlayStation? It's just a matter of choice. Um, what I am really curious about is 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 the is the price point because I have a guesstimation of what the price point is because it's usually the same every generation, but it could be different. They could drop it, so uh, who knows? We'll we'll wait and see for that. Because one. moving the, uh, the on re- to our next one. Yeah. <laughs> this is supposed moving to be, on. This is supposed to be kind of a rapid fire okay. thing here. We talk a little bit, initial thoughts, and then we move on. Moving on. All right. Next up, we got a. Uh, speaking of Will Smith. Uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air spinoff, reportedly in the works from uh, where Will Smith is producing again. Yes, uh, as reported in Alt Press, uh, Will Smith is um, going to be uh, producing a spinoff of his uh, famed uh, show back from the 90s, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Um, Are they going to have similar cast? Um, there, that hasn't been reported. We don't know where the, we, we don't know anything about that yet. This is just in the works, but we also know there's a reboot of Battlestar Galactica in the works. We know there's some several other things that are in the works for like working on these new shows we don't know how far this is going to go if it's going to get to pilot and then who's going to pick it up which service is going to run it because there are so many to choose from now so yeah and it's going to be um the show's going to be produced from the um, the company that uh him and his wife have producing company so it's going to be interesting to see uh, what he comes up with, but it just plays into the fact that there's a lot of nostalgia out there and a lot of uh, people reviving old shows. So, oh, yeah. you know, you have um, like Fuller House and then you have Will and Grace coming back. You have the Connors on ABC. So you have a lot of, you know, returning back to old times. That's true. So, all right. Uh, our next little bit is part of our Disney Plus watch. Um, this is an article from Screen Ran. And the, basically the article theorizes that the biggest competition for Disney Plus will be Netflix loyalty. Yeah, so uh, Screen Rant put out, um, put out an article which was it's more, more of an amalgamation of uh, things from past. So they, they've done polls and pretty much a majority of the polls say a lot of people that are already Netflix uh, subscribers aren't going to uh, ditch the streaming service and jump shit. They might try the other one or stuff, but they're not going to just drop their Netflix just because. Yeah. So. Me personally, I'd stay at Netflix. I'm not paying for it, so I'm going to stay with it too. <laughs> I have it through my cell phone provider, so it's not. Mm-hmm. I'm not losing any sleep over it. Yep. But uh, we'll hold that thought though. Let's see uh, other shows for streaming services. It looks like the. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with Band of Brothers and the Pacific. Both to both World War II doc, documentary dramas type things. Well, apparently, there's a there's a follow up called Masters of the Air, which is going to be coming to the Apple TV Plus. Yes, service. so it's announced on Collider that um, um, Tom Hanks and 
uh, Tom Hanks is bringing a third series of the World War II uh, Masters of the Air to Apple Plus, which is a a, a big a big uh, a big thing for Apple Plus because they are really really hoping to get you know a good subscriber base because unlike Disney Plus who has a foundation with all their properties, Apple Plus is just shooting for the moon with all their original content at launch. Mm -hmm. So having um, having a big one like this from Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. Um, and being World War II and a lot of recognition from Band of Brothers in the Pacific, you might get some people to subscribe just to see what this show is about. Mm -hmm. All right. If it only wasn't on Apple. <clears throat> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I guess you I guess you have to have friends who who happen who happen to have that service. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, amazing, uh, speaking of things we don't have enough time to watch. Uh, another bit from our Apple, from our, not our Apple, but our Disney Plus watch is IGN has updated their article about all the shows coming to Disney Plus, and this list is nuts. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm just, uh, when I well, saw well, this well, list. Let me break it down to categories. Every Star Wars film. Every single every one. Every Marvel film. Well, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Not every Marvel film. Only six of the 23 MCU films at launch. Mm. Only six of at launch, and that's because a lot of stuff are tied into contract um, stuff with either Netflix or other oh, movie yeah. streaming services. Okay, but, well, the majority, a, a good chunk of the Pixar library. Pretty much, at I launch. think, yeah, pretty much every single one. And then, as is pretty much confirmed, the Fox Marvel cartoon lineup. All of it. All the Fox cartoons from the 90s will be on there. So that includes X-Men animated series, Spider-Man, Iron Man, everything that made me smile. But there was one thing on this list that I saw that, that caught me off guard. And I didn't even realize that hmm. forgot Apple had rights to it. And it was, um, this is just ties to my heart and ties back to the 90s. It's, no, no, no. Boy Meets World. Oh yeah. They will have the full series of Boy Meets World on Disney Plus. When I saw that on the list, I literally just jumped out of my seat because I loved watching that show in the nineties. Well, I was looking at all this other stuff where it's like all these classic Disney movies. Swiss Family Robinson, the original Mary Poppins. I mean there's just oh good lord. It's like yeah, I could just you just yeah. sit and do this, and it's like every all right. pretty much ninety percent of all Disney properties. Mr. Boogity, oh my god, Mr. Boogity. <laughs> and right. just to reiterate the the fact that Simpsons is going to have all thirty seasons on there. Yeah, Mr. Boogity's on there. I'm good. <laughs> the Simpsons. Alrighty, so next up, uh, we have a few more left here, and that uh, this is kind of a not game. Specific game, so much specific or so, but definitely um, one of those where it's like we've all talked about what we're gonna, do, people are gonna do after high school. Yeah, and we've talked about it's like we've we've all grown up in the gener in, in this whole push to oh you're not gonna get anywhere unless you get a, a college degree. Yeah. So for years and years and years it was college degree, college degree, college degree. Well, there's a backlash now. And in this article from uh, PBS, PBS, PBS was uh, basically <coughs> highlighting that California is going to be investing several million dollars into their vocational schools to try and curb the stigma that vocational about vocational schools. Because of the last two decades of pushing everybody to college. Yeah, so it, based on the article from PBS, they said that California is spending $6 million on a campaign to revive the reputation of the vocational education and $200 million to improve the delivery of it. And, quote, it's a cultural rebuild, unquote. Well, I think it's really good because, you know, things like the Mike Rowe Foundation yeah. and whatnot, and it, it, being someone who is, has a trade background... Yeah. I mix. I like this because even I saw in my time as a trade, yeah, n a new influx of people into the trades is not something you're seeing. Yeah, it, it's, it's like it's either all of the jobs are going to third party, third country nationals, who are coming over and doing these these trade things, or yeah. it's the youth 
are no they want nothing to do with a trade job because they don't think a trade a, job is gonna be of any value yeah. when there are trade jobs that pay better than yeah. quote-unquote college jobs yeah it's it's an amalgamation of a lot of things that factor you have globalization you have a different generation that's built on the mindset of uh, image and self-indulgence over the fact that you could get this this trade job that gives you three times as much money than just working at an office nine to five every day mm -hmm. but you know it, it goes to show that people aren't actually looking at fit and value over it more so than image mm -hmm. because they think that you have to go to college you have to go to here you have to do that but you don't when you leave high school you have a plethora of choices and trade school is one of them and it should be one that should be highlighted as an equal value to college to military to everything in between mm -hmm. because when it comes when it comes to show it's all about finding your place in society in this world but also finding a way to make money for the future oh yeah and you have to have all those things you and know, even a even a quote-unquote college yeah. job still going to require access yeah. to a tradesman yeah. to do certain things because a computer programmer is not going to know how to to read yeah. drywall a house oh yeah or fix a or not necessarily fix a pipe granted youtube can teach you a lot of things but there is still a level of knowledge you get from a trade that yeah. you're not going to get from a YouTube video. And basically, and with the YouTube videos are coming from tradespeople. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. And basically, with <laughs> with the highlight of our just the infrastructure in America crumbling, trade schools are going to be prime and big, so they're going to need people to rebuild a lot of this infrastructure. Oh yeah, especially with the manufacturer coming back to the U.S. Yeah. Alrighty, our next uh, topic, two left. So, counting down with us. Uh, let's see. This is another one you found last minute. AMC Theater is entering the streaming market. Yes, as reported on Please CNN Please tell me Business. more. So, basically, AMC Theater, the largest movie a theater chain in, in the world, is going to be launching a streaming service, an on-demand streaming service. Um, so, what it's going to do, as according to the CNN Business article... AMC, AMC Theaters On Demand, a digital movie service that will allow members of its stub loyalty program the chance to rent or buy from 2,000 films produced by major Hollywood studios like Disney and Universal. And you'll get access to them after their theater run has, hmm. um, has finished. And they announced this Tuesday films will cost roughly between $3, to $3 and $5.99 to rent and $9.99 and $19.99 to buy. Hmm. All right, so just another avenue to purchase films. Oh, yeah, so it just uh, builds upon the fact that um, with the evolution of streaming, everybody's trying to get into the market. Oh, Even yeah. Even the movie theater changed. As if 900 channels on TV ain't bad enough, now we got 980 channels on hey. streaming. Options are options. All right, our last uh, item for the evening happens to be a congratulatories, and again, Marvel applause to this man oh yes Woohoo! marvel promotes kevin feige to chief creative officer as reported on ign the mouse of house decided to give him the keys to everything Woo -hoo -hoo. deadline reports that feige's new position will see all creative executives reporting to him marvel entertainment president dan buckley will report to Feige on all publishing, creative, and editorial endeavors, mm -hmm. and also continue to oversee publishing, operations, sales, creative services, games, licensing, and events. Wow. Yeah, so that means he has a fine tool grip on what goes in and out of Marvel. So it doesn't matter if it's TV, film, or the comics. He has the final say on everything. But it, that just goes to show and a testament to his hard work in building the MCU. Because oh, yeah. out of just that 10, 11 years, that is a feat that I believe will not happen again. Because that, that kind of storytelling and that kind of just managing those projects, let alone keeping the everything, the length, the length and the tie. Yeah, the tying them all together is what that... That's, that was amazing yeah. because even... In the earlier movies, 
they already had the plan of the end. Yeah. So you've seen the little bits in the beginning of these movies, but you really didn't catch on to it. You had a hint, and then when you watched the last movie, you're like, oh, that's what yeah. that was. You a lot of tie-ins. The hint a lot after. of tie-ins. Yeah. So it just goes to show that he has a good creative mind because, mm-hmm. like the voice of the audience said, um, you have to, when you write a story or write anything, you have to plot the end. You have to plot the tie-ins, not the not the gut. So mm-hmm. if you have the pinpoints of everything, then you can link it in. All right. Now with that, we will uh, go ahead and uh, transition over to Patreon bonus. Um, Skadoosh. Before we do that, we gotta go. We'll go through and do our contact info. And uh, again, a shout out to Sirenscape for the backgrounds and uh, soundboards. Lead us off on the contact info. This contact time. info. You can find me at in, uh, Instagram at Inkerpistrab. Message me, like me, send me an invite. All right. You can find me on Twitter at Seven Cod, and you can also find uh, the studio. You can reach out to the studio through Facebook slash Scuba Studio. And if you do like you like the show and you want to show some more support, we do have a Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash Scuba Studio. Feel free to be a Patreon. Patreon members get additional content in the episodes as well as, depending on the level you subscribe at, creative input on what stuff we're working on, working on what other shows we've got in development right now. Because yeah. there is more than one. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> there can, uh, yeah. Yeah. There can be more than one. Yes, and one of those things we're working on is actually streaming this uh, show, as well as putting videos, weekly videos, up on uh, YouTube for it. Hopefully we can get that going. Yes, there's definitely some tech upgrades with that, but, you know, got some friends who are willing to jump in and help build this project. Much appreciated. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Can't take you. Yeah, well, you know, I babysit them once a year, so they'll get over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I think that's uh, we're gonna definitely call it a night for there. Um, so thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for listening. Y'all have a great evening, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Peace. Peace.